scripture reading this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Here begins the reading. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by our works, so that no one can boast. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, for today, for the season that we're in, and for the promises that are eternal, may they intersect. May you awaken deep within each of us the inner person, the inner heart, the Holy Spirit that's upon our spirit. May it take over. May we hunger for your word. May the Holy Spirit bless me with the gift of preaching and bless your congregation, your people paid for by the blood of Jesus. May you bless us all with a hunger for you. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today it begins a topic of a series that I'm very excited about. I've been excited about it since uh, early April. For four weeks, we will we'll, we'll be remembering what took place 500 years ago in Wittenberg, Germany, in Geneva, Switzerland, which is now known as the Protestant Reformation. As we enter this conversation, this meditation, we do have four weeks, so we're not going to jam-pack it too much, although there's more books written about this than we could read in a lifetime. There's more figureheads involved. The two we will be looking at are Martin Luther and John Calvin. Next week, our focus will be on what the Father did through Martin Luther, but the sermon will not be about Martin Luther. It will be about the Gospel, the Scriptures, and the things that Luther heard and shared with the Church. As we begin this focus... It's critical to understand that this is not an anti-Catholic series. Uh, most of uh, us have Catholic uh, friends and relatives. Many of you were raised in the Roman Catholic Church and have a deep respect for her, but for some reason you're with us. I'll just say that. This is not an anti-Catholic sermon, and there's a few things we need to get covered up front. The first thing to remember is that we're called Protestants simply because we protest. And to this day, we protest. Now, when you're protesting something, you're not leaving. You don't leave something you protest. You just leave if you want to leave. But you stay if you protest, right? And that's a word for our country right now. You stay. And so, in reality, there is more in common between us and the Roman Catholic Church than disagreement in terms of volume. In fact, if, if you want, you can join with me in, in looking at, uh, in your hymnal on page 359. You don't have to turn. You can just uh, take my word for it. Uh, there is in our hymnal the Apostles' Creed written. Of course, disciples can't handle that word, so we say apostolic affirmation of faith, which I don't, just come on. Uh, 
Many of you might have been raised in in a movement that recited this creed every Sunday, if not every day. These are... uh, What's written in this creed is the base of a pyramid that's shared across the nations by Christian, gospel-centered, Bible-based believers. This is what we have in common with the Roman Catholic Church, with Presbyterians and Baptists. Some of you may struggle with the details, and that's fine. But please know that the average Christian across the globe hears these words and says, yeah, amen. The Apostles' Creed defines what it is of the basic doctrines of truth that were revealed through Jesus Christ to the early apostles into the church. And as I've told a Sunday school class this past year, I may not stand up here and preach the Apostles' Creed every week, but if we want to be a church in line with God's story, it's foolish to preach against it. For instance, the virgin birth is in here. It benefits you none to argue that Mary wasn't a virgin, she was just a young girl, which I've heard preached a bunch of times for no reason. But the Apostles' Creed says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, praise God, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We agree on the Trinity. We agree on the resurrection, on the Holy Spirit, forgiveness of sins. If you don't believe in forgiveness of sins, good luck. On the resurrection, all the, the virgin birth, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, that He was raised on the third day. He did ascend and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. The whole world changed because of Jesus Christ. We believe in the unity of the church. The Protestant Reformation came down to two things. And that's what we're talking about today. Three other things evolved, but these two were the primary issues upon which we protested. You see, this Reformation occurred, this Gospel moment, this light shining in my face right now and in many of yours, this light entering into the world, came after 500 years that we call the Dark Ages. These were ages, centuries, defined by solid institution, but no Holy Spirit. Solid institution and control and predictability, but no one was actually experiencing the love and warmth of God. People may have had their doctrine straight, but their relationship was off. Joan of Arc came out in this period of time. In fact, she was... She was condemned and killed. You know why? Because she met the Holy Spirit. And she dared to stand in front of her church and say, guys, this is going to sound crazy. But God spoke to me. And I know. I don't think. I know I'm going to go to heaven. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. And the church at that time, with the doctrine at that time, said, blasphemer. For it's arrogant to say, I know I'm going to heaven. Over and over, people would have minor experiences here and there, and then the church would squash it. Five hundred years this was normalized. And as we go through this series, we'll, we'll be looking at the distinctions between what the scriptures say versus what the church was doing at the time. And And there was this monk who came out raised in this system. He became a believer for all the wrong reasons. Martin Luther, he even confessed later in life, I hated God. This righteous God that required righteousness of me. This judge
Martin Luther had his own experiences. He entered into the ministry. He trained. He went to their seminary. He became a priest of the Augustinian order. And then he had a collision that I'd like to share with you today. Martin Luther decided, what if I quieted down all the voices, including the Pope, the Holy Magistrate, the the, the court, the council of the church, what if I silenced all of these things and I used all my training in Hebrew and in Greek and in Latin and just read the Bible? That's where it began. A monk, a frustrated monk, a tired and weary monk from earning his salvation as opposed to receiving it through faith alone, he said, I'm going to take the time and just read the Scriptures. What he found from the Bible was something different than he was hearing preached from Rome. Rome. And so the first thing that happened in the Protestant Reformation, if you're taking notes, the first thing that caused the protest was an issue of authority. We call it sola scriptura, Bible only. In those days, the Catholic Church, and to this day, the Roman Catholic Church says, no, we believe in the Bible. But the most powerful word of our Reformation wasn't the Bible, it was the word only. Sola. We believe in the Bible, and we believe in the Pope, and we believe in the magisterial courts, and we believe in the princes of this land, and and they all kind of work together to determine what truth is. And Martin Luther said, no, 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 only, only. You see, whatever your authority is of truth is going to determine how you understand the world. If I found three different people and asked them, what's wrong with our country? A progressive person would say, well, there's too much injustice and the president's getting away with murder, and et cetera. A conservative person would say, what's wrong with our country? Liberals. You can laugh, it's okay. I I hear this all the time. If you ask a religious person, what's wrong with our country? We don't trust God. Depending on who you ask, you're going to get a different answer. And depending on who you ask about salvation and the work of Jesus Christ, you ask the Pope or you ask the Bible, I'm just telling you, you might get a different answer. Luther discovered that. He discovered that if he went sola scriptura, he would have a completely different side of truth. I had a conversation with somebody recently, and they don't like the, the, the concept of biblical infallibility, that the Bible's perfect. They, they, they can't handle that. And I understand. I get it. I'm a thinking person. There's two different stories in Genesis. And one man was created second after all the plants and animals, and or last after all that. And the other story, man was created before all the animals. I get it. On, on Easter morning, there's four different accounts of what happened, who was there, and why, you know. I understand why people would struggle with the concept of biblical infallibility. And so I asked this person, okay, I get it, absolutes are hard for you, but who's more fallible, you or the Bible? Who's, who's you or the Bible? Who's more fallible, the culture out there or the scriptures? Because we're having a lot of clashes right now There's a sexual revolution that is happening right now. Who's right? Who's who's your intellect? Have you ever been wrong? I'm wrong 800 times a day. I'm gonna have to go home and repent on something I'm saying right now. It happens all the time. It's great. But the scriptures have never been wrong. Now, you can use the Scriptures for hate. You can use the Scriptures for racism and judgment and and all that stuff. But the 
Spirit's use of the Scriptures is always piercing, sharper than a double-edged sword, separating bone from marrow. And so the beginning of the Reformation started with a simple trust in the Scriptures and a skepticism toward other sources. If you don't believe in the Holy Scriptures, you will be a slave to whatever sounds right. If you don't believe in the Word of God spoken through the Bible, you will be a slave to a wet finger in the air. And those married to the, this age, those married to the host culture, are destined to become a widow. Changes. This doesn't change. And so Luther fell in love with meeting Jesus in the Bible. One image that was given to him, he said, imagine the Bible is the manger upon which the baby Christ is laid. It's not about how much scripture you memorize, it's encountering Jesus in the Bible to see him move. And so Martin Luther began something that had never been heard of. 500 years Luther against the world. He said, I'm going to be skeptical of my own thoughts, be skeptical of the culture. Not mean, but just skeptical. I'm going to be skeptical of what my grandmama taught me and what the Pope taught me, and I'm going to read the Bible for myself. And it turns out, at least in that day, that the Bible was teaching something different than what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching regarding salvation. Nathan read one of the scriptures that changed Martin Luther. His favorite book was the book of Galatians. He also liked the book of Romans, the book of John. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is God's gift to you, not by works, so that no one can boast. Next week we will be getting deeper into this concept, but Martin Luther had been pastoring and trained in a system that said that Jesus didn't satisfy God on your behalf, but the church was teaching that Jesus opened up the doorway through which you can satisfy God by all your good works. through the machinations of the church, through the saying of masses, through the visiting uh, the pilgrimages to Rome, through prayers, through, through good deeds. Life is a big test and you want to do more good than you did bad. We've heard this out in the streets, haven't we? He was teaching, the, the Catholic Church at that time and even to this day was teaching, have confidence in what you add to Jesus. It adds up, they said. This was the concept of purgatory. That no one could do enough good works in their life so they, after death, God's gracious enough to give them an office in the corner to keep working and as soon as they finish their work, it may take another thousand years and they're going to spring into heaven and Martin Luther happened to read the Bible one day and found something that was going to shake the foundations of the institution. An institution that had been receiving money so that people didn't go to hell. An institution that controlled people by saying, this is more of a sin than this one. An institution that was crushing people. Martin Luther heard the gospel. And the gospel says that Jesus Christ has already satisfied God completely. That the same blessing that Jesus heard upon his baptism, and the transfiguration. This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. The thing you've always wanted to hear. The only satisfactory message from God. Divine approval and acceptance. Jesus has it. And He'll give it to you if you trust Him. What Martin Luther heard was the second 
of the solas, sola fide, by faith alone. Jesus is yours. Like the criminal on the cross next to Christ, never baptized, never attended church, never did a good deed. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Truly, I say unto you. Jesus received this sinner by faith alone, not by works. And so as we, as we wrap this one up today, I, I want to challenge you to become very skeptical of what the culture teaches about religion, what the culture teaches about being right with God, what even church at times has taught out of being fearful and institutionally minded, and we've all done it. Preachers have all said false gospels and we're repenting all, around the, all over the globe. But here's the deal. On the campus of Texas Tech University, 35,000 students. You've got students with 4.0s, you've got students in fraternities and sororities, students that are struggling, students all over the place. And here's the mystery. Whoever has faith in Jesus Christ, whoever has faith in Jesus, even if your life is a hot mess, whoever has faith in Jesus Christ, you know what God sees? He sees his own son's glory walking as you walk. He sees his own son's beaut beautification and glory and desirous nature. He sees perfection over you as you walk from class to class, as you go down the aisles of Walmart, whoever you are, whatever you're doing, you already have everything you've ever wanted through faith alone in Jesus Christ without lifting a finger. If you add to Jesus, you're saying he's not sufficient for me, but those who have faith in Christ alone, it's credited to them as righteousness. Jesus got a hold of your bank number and he filled you up. And you don't think you deserve it, which is good. And the world definitely doesn't think you deserve it. And some ministries don't think you deserve it unless you go to church enough or work hard enough. But our hope is in what Jesus thinks. And Jesus thinks you're worth dying for. And the Father thinks you're worth adopting as a son or daughter. And when you go to heaven, you aren't interviewing for a position. You're not proving your way in. You're not kicking the dirt saying, oh, I don't deserve to be here as much as Dave Bender or Jen. I, I, I'm just a sinner, you know. I've joked before, if your spirit animal is Eeyore, quit it. When you step before the glory of the Lord in the end, it's going to be God wrapping you in his arms, saying, we aren't complete without you. We have reason to celebrate. Here's your house. Here's your seat. Here's what you'll be doing. I want you to sing alto, not tenor this time. Here's your, here's your thing. God's going to be saying, I am more invested in you than you are. My purposes for your life were in work before you knew my name, before you were born. I am your God. Martin Luther was blown away. And so should we. That the Scriptures teach consistently and clearly that everything required of us has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And anyone who has faith in the sufficiency of Jesus is as if we've never sinned. And praise God for that. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, by the power of the gift of Christ, through the testimony of the Bible, Old and New Testament, beginning with Cain and Abel, why was Abel's gift received and Cain's not? 
by faith. Abel was the first martyr killed for his faith in any persecution, any weariness we're feeling. May that not cause us to become shaky on where we are with you, but instead stand firm that we will be persecuted for righteousness' sake. We believe, Father, we believe that what the Bible teaches consistently is to be trusted more than what we think, feel, or what the newest doctrine wave of thought out in the streets is so that we can walk in the true divine approval through faith alone in Jesus Christ and then go serve this world like light unto a weary world. Father, Jesus Christ is our rock and we confess him now. We stand upon him. We thank you for the gift of Martin Luther and all the reformers. And as we spend this season to reflect on him, may it grow in us a growing esteem for who Jesus Christ is. May we meet him in the scriptures and may we taste and see that your approval is ours just through faith. We pray this prayer, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our sweet Savior. Amen. Friends, having heard and received the, the gospel of Jesus this morning, let's stand.